And then the other times think I'm shit. I'm terrible and I was shit there because I was nervous. I was a nervous wreck in training and in games. I was made to feel like that by the changing room and the fans. That's the truth. So, so I want to do this. Mansfield Town, shithole. Grimsby Town. Great. My guest today is a remarkable singular life force who's almost decade and a half footballing career I've seen him progress through four tiers of the football pyramid from England's south coast to the East Midlands, while seemingly playing for every team with Shire at the end, except the one Tolkien wrote about at six foot five. He'd be a goal scoring threat even from the concession stand, but his tenacity with the ball, ability to create space without it, those are what make him dangerous every single time he's on the field. Uh, since joining Wrexham in January 2022, on a club record transfer fee of $381,000. He scored 37 goals in 99 appearances in all competitions and was a crucial part of the Red Dragons' long-awaited, cherished promotion from the National League to Mighty League 2. It's also quite possibly the most handsome man Surrey has ever produced, unless historians discover that Olivier Giroud was secretly born in Guildford. It's incredible to welcome striker. Oh, shirtless model, entrepreneur, it's Mr. Ollie Palmer. Hi, that is a long introduction. Thank you. How are you? It's been a lot of life for you there, Ollie. It has been a lot, a lot of life. And we are speaking at a momentous occasion. We are almost just a couple of days before the two-year anniversary of your club record-breaking move to Mighty Wrexham. You came from League One AFC Wimbledon. Wrexham then, halfway through their 14th frustrating season in the National League. Then newly appointed manager Phil Parkinson hoped that adding you would be a bit like giving Andy Dufrentz a rock hammer and help the club escape from football's fifth tier. But since then, Wrexham have only gone and achieved promotion to League Two. They're currently third place, two points off league leading Stockport as we speak. And according to Opta Statistics... Ollie, you've been photographed shirtless at least two dozen times along the way. Can you put into words how your life has changed over the past two years? Did you have any idea how much it would? Um, I had a little idea just because of who the owners were and what what the manager was trying to achieve. You know, when we spoke before I signed for Wrexham, um, he told me about the football club, the community and the passion. So, um yeah, I had a small idea that it would be a roller coaster, but yeah, probably not a probably not as good as a roller coaster as what I uh, imagined. How much has it changed? Would you say from the inside? Oh, it's been incredible. Um, you know, I, I knew it'd be good, but I didn't know it'd be this good. And th- there's been so many improvements at the football club. You know, um, just just little things from the lunch meals that we used to have to what we have now. Uh, <laughs> the, the stadium. Um, the, obviously this new stand they put in behind the goal the medical team have put the new gym into the stadium so the club you know is trying to do everything right and then you've also got the other things that a lot of people don't know about I think before uh, the youth team used to so the academy used to wear their kit and they would have to hand it back and kind of sharing and borrowing um, but the owners actually bought the, the whole academy um, in each age group, a kit each. And it's just things like that that people don't know about where they've changed the infrastructure of the football club and uh, yeah, they're running it like um, a top-level football club, which is, you know, justice to everyone in this community who support it because it is, it's followed like a, I'm going to say championship football club just because of, it's limited with the size of the stadium. But ultimately, we followed like a Premier League team. You know, the the away support we've got is incredible. Um, home and away, um, full out, week in week out, and you know it, it's only right the clubs run how it is. And um, yeah, they've done a, an unbelievable job behind the scenes. You know, people like Sean, people like Fleur, um, Humphrey. So yeah, it's it's a great place to actually go into work. Lunch meals before. Lunch meals now. Just give us, just give us that snapshot when you said the meals were, were, were then and the meals now. Microwaved, 
bowl, <laughs> cardboard box. Uh, is that is that now or is that no, at the no, beginning? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was a mic. Was, you know, I think it was a, a reheated uh, cardboard box of food. Didn't taste great. Um, but again, the club were trying to do things where, you know, um, trying to give us the best food and bringing in food, you know, for the best money saving you know they were, i think they were trying to balance different ways of doing different things and kind of testing out different methods to now we've got a chef in who cooks good food healthy meals um all your vegetables your meat your fish you got breakfast i can't remember if there was breakfast when i signed i think there was but it would have just been toast and things like that now you know you got your salmon your ham scrambled eggs fruit oats um so yeah the club have invested heavily in what's going on behind the scenes and um oh i'd, I'd bite your arm off for a microwave cardboard box ollie palmer but in the first series of welcome to wrexham your team co-owner rob McElhenney, he compared your arrival to quote the irish guy in braveheart as the character they introduce about halfway through the movie and it completely changes the trajectory of the whole thing you've started in 73 league games for wrexham and the mighty red dragons have only lost just a handful of times with you in the first 11. You play with the tenacity and desire of someone still trying to prove themselves at the beginning of their career, but the physicality of a nightclub bouncer trying to stop someone from jumping over that velvet rope. Have you always been that kind of player, or is it something that you've grown into or that you've turned yourself into? Have you always been this descriptive? <laughs> I, t- I think everybody says that about you. You are. <laughs> Doesn't everyone say, no, get it's... back that velvet rope, you little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um as soon as coming here it's been an absolute pleasure to 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 represent this football club and you you know it's not just me i think everyone's fallen in love with with everything that's going on here you know the fans the, it's not just the fans because i've been in big stadiums where it's quiet it's the passion and the commitment and the support and um you know, the the gaffer's obviously gone and signed up, you know, plenty of players since he arrived. And I think he's done his homework on, um, I've said it many times, but he does his homework on people first. You know, he goes... Phil Parkinson. Yeah, Phil Parkinson. He goes on people before talent. And um, it's just about getting the right characters in. And, you know, it's been pretty easy to fit into this changing room. And that goes for, you know, anyone else that's walked in the last year, you know, your Elliot Lees, your Stephen Fletcher's, James McLean's, um, Arthur in goal, um, Jordan Tunnicliffe, anyone who comes into the dressing room, you know, they're, they're made to be very welcome. And to not get to not fit in this dressing room, you've got to be a bit of a dick. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great place to go to work. I feel privileged to go in to, you know, to go in and train with Wrexham every day and um, obviously play for them on a Saturday and a Tuesday so it's yeah no it is I, I do I know I keep repeating it but I do love being here and I can I tell want to try and, I, can I tell. want to try and spend as many long years as I can here because um I do really enjoy it and it's it's just been with the lads the lads are great. I, I, I want to talk about it. I also want to know in another conversation how much of a being a dick is a bit of a dick I'm now like stressed to to f on this one but Ollie, I we've got a to lot mention this in football <laughs> 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 to be fair, I think we some got... people, some people might say I was one of them. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's none in our dressing room. There's none in our dressing room, and everyone's together. It doesn't matter if I'm out injured at the moment, but it doesn't matter if you're out injured. If you're out of the squad, if you're you know just out of form, there's such a togetherness where I've been in other dressing rooms where it just gets a little bit acidic, and people either don't care or don't want the team to win or don't want. But it's not like that here. Everyone wants the absolute best, whether it's on the field or off the field, whether it's, you know, scoring a goal or someone doing something productive for a charity outside. People just help. We help each other. And uh, I feel like that shows on the pitch. It shows everywhere, honestly. I mean, you talk about the characters, and uh, we've got to mention this again. To anyone who spent more than 15 minutes on social media, it seems like pretty much the moment Wrexham landed in Las Vegas to celebrate winning the National League, to celebrate reaching League Two finally after that just exile of you know 15 years out of it. I think you were in customs. Maybe you hadn't even cleared customs, but Ollie Palmer, you lost your shirt and you didn't find it again. I think until the first match of the season. Is that true? What's with the top list? 
I don't get all the toughness jokes. When have I? I mean, is, is that because of Mr. Reynolds always telling me I've got my shirt off? He loves the big yes. sweaty cuddle. I can't say he yeah. loves the big sweaty cuddle. But, to be fair, I think Rob McElhenney has got a better body, and probably Ryan now has been filming Deadpool than most of the lads anyway. So they haven't got to worry about us having our tops off. You, might, you, you mentioned Ryan Reynolds on the show constantly insists that you quote put a shirt on before talking to his his wife Blake Lively um, and in an interview over the summer Rob and Ryan described you as the player who most enjoyed being on camera which was the I mean I think the ultimate compliment Ollie, Ollie how do you do it how do you make being on screen in a wildly popular television show look so bloody it, you make it look easy you make it look like you are always just Saver in every second. No, I think it's just being authentic and just being yourself all the time. Um, a few years ago, four or five years ago, I remember having a conversation with my dad. And was, why is everything so generic? Why are you being so plain face? Why can't you just be yourself? And I was saying to my dad, well, footballers don't really do that. If you show too much personality, maybe you're flamboyant or maybe you're not interested in football or maybe you're not, you know, you don't care about the result or maybe you're trying to make it about you. But I feel like as the years have gone on and, from especially you know from when I was at Wimbledon, I really kind of grew into myself and the changing room there because I love my time at Wimbledon. I feel like it's important to actually have a personality and be yourself and don't kind of shy away and be this robot in front of, in front of the camera. And that's talking about press, that's doing interviews, post game, pre game, and just being yourself. Um, and if people don't like you for that, then that's absolutely fine. But I feel like there's a lot of lads in there now that you know, are themselves and that, you know, what you see is what you get on camera. Um, and some people don't like being in front of the camera, which is absolutely fine because that's who they are. They don't want, they don't want to be in front of the camera. You know, if, if they're being filmed, maybe they'll go a little bit quiet and more reserved. That's who they are. That's absolutely fine. But you know, there's myself or there's plenty of other lads as well that don't go shy when the camera comes out. So, um, it's just about being, you know, like I said, authentic and, and, and just being yourself. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not bothered if the camera's there or not. I just like to have a bit of a laugh with the lads. So. You know, you talk about what you've learned along the steps of your career and Ollie Palmer, just the, the, the steps of your career are fascinating. The origins of your career are fascinating. Oh, I need to speak you the... to you more. You're so kind. With you, my you the rep... it's, Ollie, this is all, this is, by the way, just to be candid, this is all true. It, 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 let's start with this one. You were the rare latecomer to professional football. You didn't work your way to a club's youth system. You weren't, you weren't in an academy as yeah. a highly touted 10 year old. Done your homework. You really done your homework. Yeah. So you, I, uh... you, you, you said, quote, I'd never set foot in a professional football club until I was 20, which is amazing. First, yeah, how did it happen? That? That you... Where did you find that? <laughs> uh, in, in, your, in your forthcoming autobiography, I Never Wear a Shirt by Ollie Palmer. People say to me all the time, you should, do, you should do one of those because yes. you know, your life's incredible. But get Mullen, that get is how did it, how did that. it happen? How did it happen that you realised that you had skills, a very particular set of skills, to put the ball in the back of the net that could that could do more than just play with you, you know, playing Didn't, on the field with I, your mates? I don't think I did know. I don't think I did know. I just had like a real love and passion for playing football. Um, I I always wanted to be a professional footballer, and I think getting to sixteen and just playing week in week out with your local team. Being the best local team as well, it wasn't just like, you know, we were beating everyone in, in, in the county and stuff like that. And then we had team players in our team that were going in and out of academies. And then representing your county when I was 15, 16, traveling around England, um, playing other counties. Um, that was pretty cool. But again, that's still grassroots stuff, right? Um, and then it was probably from 16 to about 19 where wasn't actually my mum or my dad. It was my it was my grandparents actually, mainly my granddad who would come down on me really hard. Family barbecues, Christmas, birthdays, whenever we're together, you've got to get a job. You've got to stop living in La La Land. You know, you're not going to be a professional footballer. And you know, that's his era, and that's fine. I love him because it actually it did drive me to go on and try and prove him wrong. And he he wanted the best of me. He didn't want me to dream of becoming a professional footballer and then falling flat on my ass and having absolutely nothing because I wasn't the brightest spark at school, right? So it was, what are you going to do with your life? So I then went into um, a 
academy scheme. Again, it was still non-league, but it was for 16 to 18 year olds. And it was for a team called, it was Woking Football Club. They had a college scheme. So I then went to college three days a week and trained every day. Um, but the main thing that my parents and my family were happy about was that I was now going to college, so I was studying again. I never even fucking turned up. I actually caught up with a few friends. <laughs> I caught up with a few friends from college um, who I haven't seen for years. Two lovely lads. They came up to Rex and made a weekend, and it was so great to see them after about twelve years. And um, and that's what that's 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 what this has done. This has brought me back in touch with like real, genuine friends. And um, again, so I was you know. I- Going to it's college. amazing though. It's amazing though. On one hand, you're like, it made my parents proud. I was finally in college. I never fucking went. Um, but you were Didn't also. Know, you I were just ra- wasn't fucking. I wasn't interested. I'm not interested fair, in sitting in the fair. class. You're at, you're at Woking. You're at Haven and Waterlooville. You're also working full time in construction as a roofer. Yeah, you're so I was in. doing roof. Actually, to be fair, I'm just doing an extension now. And I said, said to my wife that we need, obviously we're getting a roofer, and she's like, "Didn't you say you used to be a roofer? Could you not do that?" <laughs> Get up there. Make but yourself bloody yeah. useful. I only I'll did it for I did about a year. I probably got sacked on about a year and a half. Yeah, but um, you're doing day-long sh- This how you're doing day-long shifts. You're jumping on the train. No, you're I really practice. know. Do you know what? This is one thing I will say, and I will, you know, actually give myself a pat on the back if, I, if I'm being honest, right? I was getting up at five. I know you hear about these stories, but I was genuinely getting up at five. I was doing a roofing job till three. I didn't drive. So then I would then have to get the train. Do you know what? It wasn't even when I was playing for Woking because that wasn't too bad. That took me about an hour to get in. Yeah, it was having the Waterlooville. No, do you know what? Before that, I went on loan from Woking to a team called St. Albans and Boreham Wood on the other side of London. So I'd be roofing from five to about three and then I was getting like the train, the tube, the train. Then I was actually getting to training at Boreham Wood or St. Albans, either or both of them not too far away from each other. Then I was getting the train home and getting in, you know, making the last train. I was getting in at like 12 and then getting up again and going back on the roof at five. Like that was, that was a tough time, but I just love playing football. But, and I was being like well, That's what I wanted to know, Ollie. What are you thinking on those long train rides? And imagine you with your hood tied tight. It's midnight. Other people are hammered, having a great time going clubbing. You're just getting home, getting a couple of hours, getting back on the roof, getting back into training, back on that train. What did you think was possible? Were you having a laugh or was there a big goal that kept you going day after day? I was I was 18, 19, and oh, you got loads of energy at that age, you know? It wasn't like, you know, I've got loads of energy. You do all-nighters at that age, don't you? Like, it's not a problem. So I had lots of energy and I love football and I was making money roofing. So I had other jobs. I worked for my cousin's events company um, up in Kensington. I was just doing any job that I could land, I could enjoy and working, you know, I I would do it. And then, and then, yeah, so that loan to Boreham Wood paid off where we paid against Haven and Waterlooville. And they said, oh, who's the kid? And they said, oh, we've got him on loan from Woking. And I just got told a week later, I was like, you're going to have an Amor We got a little bid in, two grand, like fucking nothing, right? I think it's just to clear clear some paperwork probably. Um, so I then went there and then just kind of never looked back. I then had a new football club and I was playing first in football, still non-league, but I just started scoring goals. The manager, Lee Bradbury, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. You always need someone in your corner. You need someone that um, believes in you. And I had a man called Lee Bradbury, who was the manager of Hamlin Waterlooville, who did everything for me. And he worried about how I got to work. He worried about how I got to, you know, how I got home from training. Did I have a day off from roofing? Sometimes on a Wednesday, come in, Ollie, we'll do one on ones. We'll, we'll get, we'll do, we'll get, I'll get some other younger lads in we'll do like a four or five of you training, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm there. And he just wanted the best for me. And I played and I scored. I got a new deal. I then played the fourth next season. And then I, you know, got all them. I got like the golden boot for the league and um, player of the season for the league and whatnot in the Conference South. And then I just had clubs come in, professional football clubs. And I remember when I signed my first deal, I just, I was elated. 
And it all took off from there. That one gentleman believing in you, uh, you know, this kinetic career ensued. Stops at Mansfield. Well, I went downhill town. first and then it went back. So I've gone like that. I've got there to the Mansfield. Shit hole. Hated every minute of it. Hated playing there. <laughs> Hated living Grimsby there. Grimsby town. Right. Grimsby town. Hated it. I thought, what is, what is this? This is not what I've, I've dreamed. Bear in mind what I've just told you. I've dreamed about this moment, right? <laughs> I've got there. Change your room. You know what? I sort of spoke about acid people. Dickheads. Plenty of them in there. Fans moaning. like, And then, honestly, gone there. Hated it. And then I'm starting to think, I'm shit. I'm terrible. And I was shit there because I was nervous. I was a nervous wreck in training and in games. I was made to feel like that by the changing room and the fans. That's the truth. And then, so I want to do this. Mansfield Town, shithole. Grimsby Town. Great. Loved it. Passionate fans, gone on loan, and they support. And do you know what they got behind me? They've probably got this leak to failure, uh, who is not, who's now not paid in the conference. I'm not paid in the conference because I've skipped it from the conference. So I don't know how this is going to go. They're going for promotion again. Paul Hurst in my corner. Look, you're going to come here. We believe in you. Confidence, change your room. Great group of lads. Still in contact with some of them now. Fans similar to Rexton, traveling numbers, get behind the team. Um, I went there and I think I scored like, I only played 16 games, but I think I scored like eight or 10 goals. Um, and then had a playoff final and, and fortunately lost on penalties. And then that's when I got away. So I then had it yeah, I mean, on you, that you, period. You, you, you're, you're everywhere. Mansfield Town, Grimsby Town, Leighton you know, and You actually that's loved the That's when I went to two years. <laughs> Thanks to Leighton Orient for two years off the back of that uh, group to be loan. You, you, went, you went on loan to Luton Town, January 27. To yeah, you've got to be fair few... to me there, though. We weren't getting paid. <laughs> so a lot of people were leaving. The chairman was a lunatic and, um, you know, he locked us in a hotel for a week and uh, refused to pay the team from January. Like, we, we got wind that we weren't being paid. So then December didn't get paid. So I'm like, well... Fuck this. Everyone else was leaving. They were literally playing the youth team. Uh, you got, so you got locked in a hotel for a week? Yeah. One of the lads actually had a baby at the time and he wouldn't let him leave. It was quite sad, really. I don't know why. This I do talk about football and football being a um, little bit medieval times and it's not really up. I mean, if there was HR in football, I think a lot of people would get sacked, to be honest. <laughs> Listeners, you talk about the romance of football, the, the dreams that are propelling young Ollie Palmer. You have lived it all. I mean, you've lived all Luton Town, then in League Two, since been triple promoted, obviously making a return to the Premier League this season, which which must make Wrexham's dream seem very, very real. No, like it does. Wrexham's... You take inspiration from that. You do, because Luton was a great football club again, great set of fans, and they were on the up. Yeah. I mean, their stadium, like Wrexham's own Stoke Kai Ras, uh, it, like, it, it, which can be the most threatening thing in Wales since Roll Dahl on a bad day. But Kenilworth Road, that little hat box of a stadium, generating just a just an insane atmosphere. You've been everywhere. I mean, you've been every level. You've been all over the nation. As players, how aware are you of the crowd, home and away? You know, what's the most entertaining or surprising thing you've ever heard shouted from the stands at you, Ollie Palmer? I'm not repeating it on air. Get now. You're getting cancelled. I'm you getting fired on another you, podcast. You can say yes. Mansfield Town shithole, but you can't tell us what was said from the stands. Yeah, well, it, it, I hate it, that. Yeah, that, I think you get a lot of abuse from fans, don't you? But I think you like, like you've got to embrace it and enjoy it. I, you know, as long as you've got a good set of fans behind you, it doesn't matter what the you know the opposition fans are saying. You know, I get abused every week. I get abused every single week, and um, yeah, I enjoy it to be honest. Quite enjoy it. So um, that that's not a problem. I feel like for me, if you've just got a good set of fans behind you, anything's possible. And you know, I, I say this with the utmost respect to other clubs, and I'm just trying to think of fan like clubs that don't have a, a huge following with the utmost respect. But um, you see, like, maybe a, a, a non-league like Boreham Wood or, um, like, a Willstone. I mean, that, that most respect. If, if Ryan and Rob had gone in there and um, took a football club over, then it, I, I promise you it wouldn't have been the same as what they've done here at Wrexham. It wouldn't have been possible because you don't have that support, that backing, the, the, the fanatic football fans... 
And you have to have that. That's the key. And everyone learned that in lockdown when there was no fans in football. It was crap. Every single game was crap. And it just showed how important fans were. From Lincoln, you joined Crawley Town. Then August 2020, you signed with League One side AFC Wimbledon. Really a beautiful life moment. Your grandfather, Tony Wright, spent four seasons with the old Wimbledon in the late 1950s. And when you were a kid, I imagine a little a little Ollie Palmer with, with child-sized tattoos. Wimbledon was the club you supported. But counting non-league sides and the clubs you were on, with, uh, on loan, AFC Wimbledon, incredibly the 11th team you made an appearance for uh, inside a decade. Ollie, how, how does that become shuttling between locker rooms, club cultures? You see, you see a lot of life. You know, you've taken the long road what have you learned from always moving, fighting, proving yourself, having to perpetually fit in and hit the ground running? Maybe for like I'm homeless. Um, no, I think um, you, at this level, right, at anything below League One, League One, League Two and below, people move around. You're normally looking at two, three years max at a club and you move on. Um, very rarely do players stay at clubs for five, six years. It's not the Premier League. You're not getting multi-million pound deals for six, seven years or it's it's very, very common to, to move around. And I feel very fortunate to have done that, to experience so many parts of the country, you know, to live in Lincoln, such a beautiful place, to live in Essex, that was such an amazing time for me as well. Um playing for Orient and Luton. I love living in, in Essex. Um Mansfield not so much. But then coming home and then coming home, um, yeah, and signing up for Wimbledon was was a great moment for me. You know, they were back at back at Palau Lane. It was a great moment for my family, family, friends, and it was a super super proud moment. Unfortunately, I got injured in my first season. And it ended up being a really tough time. I missed the first. I missed like I missed the first thirty thirty games. I think I came back for like the last ten or eleven games. Um, which you know, which was great, and then obviously the the second season, I was only there for half a season because I ended up leaving to come to Wrexham. So I never thought I was going to leave Wimbledon. I thought that was me there for like five six years. That's what I wanted at the time. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for me, they wanted a younger philosophy at, at that football club. They wanted to sign really young, you know, like eighteen, nineteen, twenty year olds, and that's fine. That's what they wanted to do at the time, and made it quite an easy decision for me to come to Wrexham. We do have to touch upon something you've said, because you talked about the injuries. um, And you are, you know, your body, your body has been your everything. And anyone that watches you knows that you are what is apparently, I think scientifically, it's a scientific term, you are a physical specimen. Um, And it hasn't always been a straight line. You mentioned the injury. You had a surgery on your hip in in the summer of 2020. And early 2021, on your 29th birthday, you you, you posted on Instagram uh, side by side images that showed how you looked immediately after your surgery, which was which was a bit like me. And and you highlighted the long road you had to get yourself back to to, to six pack match fitness. You wrote um, really beautifully a mixture of mistakes, complications, coronavirus lockdown, and feeling sorry for myself led me to a dark place. I mean, it was a really brave and candid admission, Ollie. What prompted you to speak so honestly about your struggles? Because it was incredible. I mean, again, just going back to what I said earlier about being authentic. And I don't, I feel like, you know, you've got to be careful. You don't want to kind of open up too much and and let everyone into your private life. I'm still quite a private person, but I still want to try and help other people. And if people are going through the same things, I feel like when you speak on something, you might help someone. And um, that was a really tough time, you know, I nearly retired. I I genuinely remember being at home with my wife and crying and saying, I cannot get back fit. And there was some mistakes at Crawley that happened. And then we were in lockdown. And then I went to Wimbledon. They wanted me, I think Crawley, you know, a lot of stuff went on behind the scenes, which I'm not going to go into. And because they're good people there, but it was just a few mistakes happened and um, differences of opinions and how they wanted me. They wanted me to do something that I wasn't comfortable with doing. Um, and then signing for Wimbledon um, and having the surgery, technically failing the medical because I just had surgery, but Wimbledon wanted to sign me. So, they, you know, very gratefully signed me. And um, then I broke down from that moment. So it was post-surgery where 
I then tore my rect fem, which led into my psoas tendon through my hip. And I went to see the best specialists, you know, over the course of the year, people like James Moore in London, um, Dr. Kuga in, in Barcelona, who eventually did actually get me back, where I was at the point where I was at home crying saying I can't get back. I couldn't even sit down and lift up my leg for a year of just rehab. And I'm, you know, we, we've got great, you know, medical staff working, you know, at these at these lower league clubs and I went to see outside help and I just couldn't I couldn't sit down on the floor and lift up my leg. So I couldn't get any power through my leg and no one knew. No one knew what the hell was going on. And um yeah I needed I needed to retire. It was a tough time. And then with COVID, being at home, not training, feeling sorry for yourself, eating, drinking, and got out of bed. And then so yeah, Dr. Kuga in, in Spain, who I still um, see now just to keep on top of it because I wouldn't ever want it to come back. But um, I then got back in shape and, and worked my you know worked my nuts off to get back into a position where I could still represent. There goes my basketball. I'll put that up there just for you guys. I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the American audience, Ollie. That's amazing. Stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I was in a bad place, but I managed to get back fit. And then, um, yeah, not really look back. Started the season really well with Wimbledon. Everything was going well. We were kind of in the playoff spots and things were going well. And, you know, played away at the Emirates against Arsenal in the Cup. And um, all, all, you know, great fun. Everything going well. Left. And then January 2022, 11 months after Robin Ryan had taken over as Wrexham's new owners, the club paid a record-setting $381,000 to bring you in from Wimbledon. I love this about you. Even after signing your contract and agreeing to join Wrexham, you still played the full 90 minutes for one final game for Wimbledon. You've done of your scored... research. Of course you scored the opening goal in a draw with Burton Albion. Yeah. And you said that leaving Wimbledon, this club your grandfather played for, yeah. the club you watched with your dad that you supported as a kid, you said it was, quote, the hardest decision yeah. you've had in football. But what did you know about Wrexham at the time? What were you hoping for in your heart that would make it worth this emotionally challenging move? I, I, I didn't know a lot. Like I said, I hadn't really played in the conference. I had played in the conference south and then I'd missed the conference going into League Two. So I didn't really know a lot about Wrexham. I didn't know a lot about their history. Um, and yeah, I spoke to Phil Parkinson with the permission of the football club. You know, the manager, going on touching on that, the, the woman and manager at the time didn't know that everything had been agreed. And I got a call on Friday to say everything's agreed you're going to Wrexham. And I, I went and told the manager, it was me who told the manager, he was like, what? And I, he said, will you still play tomorrow? And I said, yeah, well, and all the lads thought I was crazy because um, I'm risking my whole contract on, on one game. But it was just the respect that I had for the football club and the manager. I would have loved to have gone out on a win. Um, but yeah, we, that wasn't to be, but I was genuine. I was a little bit, um, Little few water, watery eyes. I'm a little bit of an emotional guy, but I had a few little watery eyes to be fair after that game. And um, spent the whole road home from Burton, sat with the manager on the coach, and he was trying to talk me out of it. But um, I'd at that point made up my mind, and uh, everything had been agreed. And I didn't feel like um, from the negotiations at the start, I wasn't too valued at, at, at Wimbledon where they didn't want to give me. Well, I only asked them to match, you know, another two years to my deal and they didn't want to do that. So I said, fine. And then I spoke to Phil and he, with, with the club's permission, everything being agreed, I spoke to Phil and he just said, look, tell me about the history of the football club, European football club. I didn't know that before, I, you know, just before I signed. Tell me about the fan base, the, the travelling support, packed out stadium, the, the project, where the club was going. And I believed every word. And, um, at that point, I still hadn't spoke to the owners, but, you know, the gaffer here has got an unbelievable track record of, of promotions and, and even getting to, you know, doing really well in um, Carabao Cups and FA Cups. So um, I just kind of was sat on every word, really, and, and my mind was made up. And then 
I don't regret it. I'm even happier now. It's just such a shame it's so far away from my home. But apart from that, it's it's a bit of a long commute for me from time to time. But um, I've, from, I've from, from mighty mighty Epsom. Uh, where you commute, uh, but it's not stopped you because you made your Wrexham debut against yeah, Grimsby yeah, Town. Yeah. Of course, you went and scored the only goal in a 1 0 win yeah. against one of your former teams. So, 16 appearances for Grimsby in 2014. Quick one, can we get a ruling? <laughs> did you celebrate? Yeah, I did, but you know why? I got I get abuse off the, off the Grimsby support now. I don't know why. So, I did celebrate. That's Before the game, laugh. this is what's amazing about you. You hadn't had the opportunity to train or even to meet your new teammates. I hadn't met anyone. I walked in. You'd only learned their names because you'd looked them all up online. And you've since forged a real partnership with Merseyside-born goal machine, Super Paul Mullin, possibly the best yeah. romance since John what, Snow and Sam Watali. You seem to have immediately formed an off-the-field friendship. Occasionally, yeah. you meet for meals. You comment on his breakfast orders. By the way, I can't believe Paul Mullen, a scouser, has an avocado sandwich for breakfast either. But how does that relationship off-field factor into how you work together on the pitch? Yeah, it is, it, well, we're a, bit, a little bit like chalk and cheese now. I'm a Londoner, he's a scouser. And, uh, but I feel, I feel like it kind of it adds to our relationship and we, we get on great. And... Um, it's been great to have that partnership with him for the last two years, you know. I feel like it's, you know, it's worked well together. People think we work on things, you know, together. We don't. We just go out there and play. We just go out there and play. Obviously, the manager does his team, his team shape and, and tactical. But me and Moles ourselves, we just just give each other a high five and go out and do what we need to do together. Is that so, true? It's like if you guys don't know what you're going to do, there's no way the opposition does yeah, either. It just right? works. You know, it, it's been great. It's been great fun. And, you know, I've loved, I've loved partnering up with him. And, there's, you know, there's plenty of good strikers at the club as well. Sam Dolby is a fantastic young talent. We've got Stephen Fletcher. who got a hat-trick last week, who is, you know, incredible pedigree. And, again, all of them great guys. So, um can you tell us something we don't know about Super Paul Mullen? Can I tell you something you don't know? Yeah, that surprises. Well, if you don't know, he probably wouldn't want you to know it. So he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> he's a Tory at heart. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Now we are going to find out if he's listening for sure. <laughs> You're um, going to clip that, during, you? By the way, during Wrexham's National League winning season, you and Paul combined for an incredible 62 goals all competitions. You're like the Welsh Bash brothers. Last April, Wrexham sealed promotion, the National League title, with a 3-1 win over Boreham Wood and 15 years worth of demons exercised. Manager Phil Parkinson soaked in champagne, singing Championes, in that dressing room, you live streamed yourself sitting in the trunk of your own car, shouting, "Who's coming to the EFL?" Do you remember anything about that? What that that? What's your abiding memory of that trunk moment? Well, I because we all had a few friends and family of us, so I had my two two of my best mates, and we were like getting into town, and car pulled over just to say congratulations. I said, "Can you give us lift into town?" I said, "The car's full." I said, "Open the boot." <laughs> So I got it out and started filming it and I was filming my mate running trying to catch up with us because he didn't want to get left behind because he probably knew once I was in the club I'd be off and we'd, and we'd be singing and dancing. So, um, yeah, no, it's just, just a funny moment off the cuff. But um, What's your enduring memory? Just the final whistle going and the fans just steaming on the pitch and then and then after the game seeing my family, who, who, you know, who I... I've sacrificed so much time with because I'm I'm up here so much and um, working away and being so far from home. So it was, it was a real mix of emotions and you know I didn't risk anything by coming here, but I I let I what's the word I I took I took a chance I took a gamble I I didn't know what it was going to be like you know I hadn't. Didn't know anyone that was in the dressing room. I couldn't speak to anyone. It was just kind of going off what the manager told me, and um, and it paid off. You know, sometimes you got to take a little gamble with life, and I'm I'm happier now more than ever, and I have been since I walked through the door. It's been a great dressing room. It's still a great dressing room, and it's a great football club, and I just love it. I'm just enjoying it. I just wish it was. I take an hour and a half closer to London. That would be a bit better. <laughs> But what does it feel like for you, Ollie, 
after all this time as a as a traveling striker to have not just found the home but a home where you mean so much to so many people yeah no of course it all makes it worth worthwhile really um I, we were talking about buying like a house up here in North Wales, just even as like a holiday home. So in 10 years time, I could still come back here because we do love it up here. You know, the, we always stay in mould. Um, we stay in mould quite often now. Um, and you can get into beautiful places like Langoslin and um, s- some real scenic areas. And, you know, just even just going out for dinner in Wrexham, you know, go to some of the nice restaurants, you know, they've got a good carnival restaurant and, um, it, it's just things like that where you just made to feel so welcome. I love, I love being up here. I love being around here, and it's, uh, but it's hard because obviously my family are at home, and um, I'm not, you know, in this industry, as you've made it very clear about being on the road a lot and moving clubs, you never really know how it's going to go. And you know, the first year, okay, we're not going to move up. Let's see how it goes. And then it's like, well, do we pull the kids out of school and then have a year, and then it, it might not go well, or what if? I, you know, we put them out of school and then we end up moving away again and they're at school and they're settled. So it was just a joint decision just to say, stay at home, I'll commute, I'll stay up in the week, come up on a Monday, go back on a Tuesday. <laughs> I'm at home on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday, come back up on a Thursday, or Wednesday night or a Thursday. And then I train on a Thursday, stay up, Friday, stay up, play the game on a Saturday. And I'm at home on Saturday night and the Sunday. It doesn't matter where we are on a Tuesday night, whatever game, um, I'm, I'm getting back to my family on the Tuesday night. You've talked about the lads, the locker room, the joy. We've got to quickly ask you, another of your teammates, Captain Ben Tozer, came on this show, told us that he consistently Have you beat been you on at pool. Yeah, said he consistently beats you at pool. He said, quote, you were giving it the big one during Wrexham's US tour during the summer at about pool. your, your ben table beat me tennis at pool. skills. No, Ben's never beat me at pool. I'll get you a li- I'll get you some live footage of that. Yes, I need this. Because, uh, by the way, I'm only asking you because we, we, we're invested. We are serious journalists here, as you've noticed, Ollie Palmer. And uh, he said he rinched you at ping pong, table tennis, too. Even right, though again, you demanded... this is not true, right? You so at the hotel, he said you we demanded me. Do... <laughs> Let me tell you. Because he's going out there. Table tennis, battered him. Repeatedly battered him. Match after match after match after match. I then stopped, right? A couple of days of just abusing him on the table tennis table. Then I've stopped and we've gone to a new hotel outside, outside weather, you know, it was different. Different bats. Different circumstances. He had the wind, the way he plays, shit bats. And he was playing repeatedly and I wasn't. So he then got good and started beating me, beating me a couple games in a row and he wouldn't let me live it down. So he knows, get me indoors, proper bats, fresh off, fresh off, fresh off breakfast. No, yeah, yeah so he's having like 15 games warm up before I step on the table. <laughs> Not interested. <laughs> No, this is the show. This is the show within the show. My question was: Was it as one-sided as Ben remembers? Are you or kidding do you, me? Do you have a different? You telling? kidding me? It's not one-sided. <laughs> I smoked him game after game. The first like fifteen games, I don't even think he got over ten points. And then I took my foot off the gas. Different. Yeah. What's the word? Different when the word. What's the word with the gravy- word? No, but oh, no, diff- what's the call? Different like, climate. Different climate. Yeah, climate's not the word, but I'm playing a different environment with shit bats yeah. outside. Yeah. He's playing every minute of every day. Yeah. And then he started beating me. But listen, it's everyone knows the rules of table tennis. This is the closest this show's got to World Wrestling Federation. This is like where you rip off your shirt and you say, Toza, Toza, I'll take you anywhere, any day, any bat, shit bats. Um, but I want to talk about something more joyful. Uh, we've got to put those out side by side, by the way. I just genuinely am lost. I'm just the middleman in this one. Um, but just over a year ago, I mean, this is amazing. You're peripatetic. You're wandering around. You're like shooting up and down between your family and your club, between Wrexham. But you also have time to do, I mean, to just beyond incredible. You set up a clothing brand, WXM Clothing. You launched in partnership. This is amazing. Aaron B. Host who you happened to meet while you were looking for a temporary place to stay in Wrexham. I, ca- I, can't, I, can't, I can't get them to give me a late checkout, but you start businesses with them. How did this even start? You can't put my business partner on my Airbnb host. It's never meltdown. He's like a family friend now. So, yeah, yeah. it was just, it was, the, it was the, you know, 
I was looking for a place to stay um, more permanently up here and end up putting on my, my private social media to say, like, does anyone know anyone in the Wrexham area where, uh, with, a, with an Airbnb available, like a, like a lodge outside, um, annex type thing. And I got a builder, so the, the guy who was potentially going to do my extension at home said, yeah, I do know someone up there. He's from this area. He's got an outhouse, converted his garage, right? So I was like, perfect, I'll turn up there. By the way, the outhouse garage is his fucking office, which I'm sat in right now. So guess <laughs> what? I'm actually in the house. So when I turn up, knocking on the door, and I'm like saying, hi, I don't really know anything about him. They're like, come in, they're showing me around. So they're showing me the lounge, the dining room, the kitchen. And I'm like, cool, cool, cool. And then I'm thinking I'm not going to be in here anyway. And then they're like, go upstairs, show me the kids' rooms and the bathroom. I'm like, okay, cool, I get it. This is our room. They're like, this is our room. This is your room. I was like, wow. I was like, that's not gonna. I'm like, what's the microphone next to you? I'm thinking, fuck shit now. I'm thinking, no. Uh, I'm thinking, no, it's not gonna work. And then, so Man United were playing. So that I've got another place booked that night, another Airbnb booked that night. So then I'm, do you want a cup of tea? I'm like, yeah, of course I have a cup of tea. They tell me and they tell me that they go to Wrexham games. I'm like, oh, fuck, I didn't really want to stay with fat. Like, you go Wrexham, one of those kind of separate the two. And then, um, then I, like, do you want to watch Man United? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Man United fan. So, like, we'll put Man United on. And then Charlotte, his wife's cooking the roast. And she's like, you might as well stay for the roast. And I'm like, fucking hell. I was like, yeah, go on, I'm, I'm hungry. Stay for the roast. I'm like, right, I'm going to go. And they're like, you might as well just stay. Like, and I'm like, this is fucking not wrong. It's like half eight. So never left. Never left. So literally that was like eight, March, April 2022, and I'm still here now, part of the family, in the house. Amazing people. I can't tell you how nice these people are and what they've done for me and what they'd do for anyone. My business partner. This is, this is, this is amazing. This foundational story, it's almost up there with the Nike uh, foundational story, the Phil Knight um, the finding swoosh. Because we should say, based on, yeah, Ollie Palmer. Does Ollie Palmer stay for the roast? Ollie Palmer stays for the roast. Out of that has come a athletic brand. Yeah, sorry. So I was going to be scratch. talking about my clothing brand, right? Always so, be selling, Oli Palmer. Sorry, right? you've, already, you've already sold. This is incredible. Over 80,000 pieces. Big, chunky, elated collection. Not already... 80. I'm not bloody Nike. We've done, we've we've done 10,000 orders in a year, which has been good but bad. It's been hard to cope Okay, let, let's say 80. Let's round it up to 80,000, Oli Palmer. But a huge chunk of your latest collection already sold out because I tried to buy some. I mean, out of this, you've sold over over 10,000 orders. I mean, a big chunk of your your, your your latest collection has already sold out. What What's it been for you, this experience, this learning curve, starting a business? And what, what are you learning from this moment? I'm learning a lot. I'm learning about advertisement. I'm learning about meta. I'm learning about e-commerce. I'm learning about clothing, product, customer service. Because I think a lot of people think we're a big brand because of what we're doing. There's two of us. And I think people think I've just put my face to a name and I've not. It's you know, it's been a real whirlwind. And it was it was actually Darren's idea. He came up with the idea of doing a bit of a gimmicky, or oh, let's do an Ollie Palmer t-shirt, or let's do Paul Mullet t-shirt, or Elliot Lee hoodie. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. But I'm quite interested in doing a clothing brand. Let's talk about it. And Darren's got a lot of experience in graphic design and e-commerce. So over months and months and months, we kind of started drawing and building this brand and this name. And we come up with WXN Clothing and... You know, to be fair, I've had a lot of support. People like Ryan and Rob have obviously been a huge support, um, colleagues and friends. And um, it's been an amazing experience to actually use my time wisely up here. So I'm just sitting at home, sitting up here and, and, and just maybe playing golf or sat watching TV. I'm actually doing something productive. And I'm sat in the office now, you know, we've got an office space. We, we There's work to do and it, it's pretty chilled. It's not stressful, but... We've had a few like issues over like the last year and a half, just teething problems, mainly only ever because of distribution centers. And we recently just had a delay with American orders because we decided to move 
our distribution from the UK over to America to give uh, the Americans a better service. However, it was all delayed on, on launch and people had to wait six weeks, eight weeks for their orders. Not everyone, but some. And um, again, I think people feel like we're this big, this big brand, which has like 20 staff in it, 50. We're not. It's just me and Darren dealing with everything. And it's been an amazing experience. And it's, it's great. It's, it's, you know, the clothes are really good quality and I'm doing them for really affordable prices. And it's a, it's a lovely uh, loungewear product and it's something I'm really proud of. And so WXM Clothing is a, is a loungewear brand. We do predominantly track suits, oversized t-shirts, oversized hoodies, um, uh, woolly hats, caps. And it's, it's just a streetwear luxury cottons and fabrics and it's a super comfortable um, loungewear product which I think you know is great value for money and, and, and it looks great well I hope it looks great I think it does and it, you know it, it's a product that people can purchase and, and, and know they're getting good quality material and a good quality fit without actually having to spend two three hundred pound like other brands God, I am all in, and I'm going to be first thing after we finish this interview investing. We're new sold out. In... We're sold out. But when we've got some new stock back in, I'll make sure you get something. Mate, 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 I'm going to be, I'm going to be buying it off the, off the uh, resale market. But the, yeah, the story is immense. The numbers are immense that you're selling, and I bet you never thought that was possible when you're Ollie Palmer, Grimsby Town, Loney. But Ollie Palmer, Wrexham striker, is a very different reality. The experience for you, it has been life-changing. Someone who had a, a late footballing bloomer start to the career, who's had to grind their way through Ollie. You know, this singular path to glory, as you said, ups, downs, challenges, nothing straight line, huge sacrifice away from your family. What's the most important life lesson you've learned from this journey? I think just, yeah, I think time. I think time is the most important thing of, you know, of what I've learned is it's irreplaceable and it's how you spend it. It's how you spend it at home with your family. It's how you spend it when you're up in Wrexham, when I'm at work training, representing the football club, working on my clothing brand uh, and using it wisely and, and enjoying it, enjoying all the good moments, but embracing the bad moments. You know, I've been, been out injured now. I'm currently out injured with, with a calf strain and um, it's been a tough time. You know, it, it's just the way life is. I lost both of my grandparents just before Christmas, and that that was pretty tough. And then tore my calf the, the the same day I found out about my nan. And you have the good times, and you have the bad times, right? And that's life. And it's about trying to stay like that, but making sure you enjoy the the good ones and and embrace the bad ones and learn, live, and try and be happy. But yeah, for me, it's just about time and how you spend it. And um, I'm very grateful. I'm very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. I feel very very lucky. And um, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. Oli, this journey is not over. You're closing in on your 100th appearance for Wrexham. You're also 31 years of age. The League Two season just past the halfway point. First of all, when you think about your own career, you must see players like, like Thiago Silva, James Milner, still proving it's possible to play at the highest level in their late 30s. 38-year-old, I don't know if you've heard of him, Cristiano Ronaldo, he could still slice sandwich meat with his abs. What does it take, or what are you currently doing? Lewandowski. To give yourself... Yeah, God bless. You're Tim Ream's like old enough to be Lewandowski's dad. What, 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 what are you currently doing to give you, yourself the chance to stay in this game? The game has definitely changed, and you know, players are, are playing a lot longer than ever ever before. Um, you know, players are still in the peak of their condition at 34, 35, and people are looking after themselves a lot better now. So, for me, my ambition now is is to keep building and growing with this football club. I want to be here for many more years, and uh, I genuinely love it. I love playing for this football club. Um, I love the, the teammates. The staff are great. The fans are unbelievable. And, you know, I, I plan to be here for a few more years yet. Yeah. And, you know, if that takes me to 34, 35, and then I was to leave, then then that's that's fine. But I want to be playing so I'm 37, 38, um, because it's, it's what I love to do. And, yeah, it is, it's quite a normal thing now that people can't, you know, Stephen Fletcher's 37, maybe. So, you know, I don't want to do an injustice. He's 36, 37. I'm not too sure, but, you know, he's still in great shape. It's very normal now. So, you know, I want to keep growing with the football club and, you know, it's something that I'm 
really enjoying and, and don't really want it to end. He's 36. He's a youngun. See? He's a youngun. Glad oh. I, I'm glad I I'm glad I corrected myself. It looks good for 36, Steve. Yeah. Right. But again, there's, there's so many 35, 36 rounds out there, you know, and I'm only 31, so we've got five, six good years left yet. Him on the, that, that, I'd love to see the Stevie Fletcher, um, oh, Holly Palmer ping pong clash for the ages. The Stephen last Fletcher, question. Don't put me yeah. in his age bracket. He's got about five, six years on me. <laughs> Talk about the Elliot <laughs> Leeds and the Paul Wallens. They're only two years below me. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> <Last laughs> kill <laughs> you so i can get out of here alive how do you envision the rest of this journey what is possible for rex and molly palmer you're a man that's seen it all where are they going where does this story end i said i said about us getting promoted and i, and I got knocked down but we got promoted i said i believe we're going to get promoted this year and then i get knocked down and i'm i'm arrogant or whatever again it just goes back to being authentic i'm working to to do a job which gets the club promoted that's why i'm playing for Wrexham. so why why can people not say, yeah, I believe we'll get promoted because that's what we're working towards doing, right? Boxers talk about winning games. NFL players talk about winning their games. Basketball talk about smashing their opponent. Da, da, da. But I believe that this football club can go right to the very top. There's nothing standing in the way of this football club to get to the Premier League in the next 10 years in terms of infrastructure, the, the, the fan base, the investment, um, the quality of players that are currently at the squad and who I'm sure they'll bring in the future. There's nothing standing in this club's way of getting to the Premier League in 10 years. And if it takes 12, 15, sorry, I was wrong by two or three years, but I really believe that this club will go right to the very top. I might be too old then, but hopefully I'll be welcome back to watch a few Premier League games. I love this. I do. You'll be too busy. That WXM brand will be just like... Oh, it'll, be, so, it'll, be, it'll be global by then. That's the plan. Yeah, that is the plan. I I can, I, by the way, I can see that. And I can also see your pathway where Wrexham treat all comers like you treat Toza on the table tennis table. Um, I love it. I love the notion that you get knocked down like Chumbawamba, but you get up again. Oli Palmer, you are a magnificent blow. I'll just raise this to you, your family, your team. WXM clothing to all of it, mate. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. It's lovely to meet you as well. It's been great, uh, great to chat to you. Loved every second, Ollie Palmer. Courage.